Hello everybody and what's up and welcome to my channel Creating Crime Time. I'm your host Liz and basically what this channel is is I will be creating a work of art while retelling a true crime story and today's true crime story is that of Smutty Nose. Now if you are not familiar with the New England area, Smutty Nose is actually in the Isle of Shoals in Maine and it's just a popular channel of islands that everybody likes to visit especially on like boats and just see during the summertime it is rather beautiful now this case actually happened quite a long time ago we're talking about March 6th 1873 and the suspect that was of course found guilty and eventually executed for this crime his name is Louis Wagner all right so Louis Wagner is actually a German born immigrant who arrived in the United States in 1865. Now, that is actually like eight years prior to him actually committing said murders at Smutty Nose. So being a fisherman by trade, obviously, if he's immigrating to the United States, New England area is very well known for our seafood and for our fishing areas. Lobstermen are very popular in this area. So one thing to know about this case is that he until the day he was executed aggressively stated that he was innocent and that he did not commit the crimes he stated his innocence until the day he died which is something that is quite bothersome when you read upon this case because it's so peculiar the way that everything kind of like transpired through the eyewitness accounts and just why he would do it is just mind-blowing. All right, so the victims that are involved in this crime is Karen Christensen, Aneth Christensen, and a woman named Marin, Marin Huntvet. Now, these her name in particular is quite popular with within Smutty Nose itself. There's actually kind of like a landmark related to her name, and it's called Marin Rock. Now, eh. May of 1871. Now, Marin is the sister of Karen, and Karen arrived from Norway, so they were all Norwegian immigrants. Karen had arrived shortly after she had lost her great love over in Norway, so she decided to come over to the Isle of Shoals to kind of like get rid of her melancholy feelings and to restart her life. And several weeks after she came she got a position as a live-in maid on the Appledore Island which is the largest island of the Isle of Shoals so um, the other victim Aneth Aneth is actually the wife of Ivan Christensen which is Marin's brother so they all lived on the island together and they were well known to be very nice very like proper kind of very well known around town just for being nice and making sure that they have like nice things everything is very like put together things like that and the actual cottage that they lived in on the island was very well known to have like decorative papers in the windows and the flower boxes hanging out of the windows and just little things like that that people saw and really admired by, this, by 1873 now obviously Louis Wagner has been in this area for now eight years and he is completely destitute he has kind of burned all the bridges that he's had with fishing and he's just barely paying room and board at um, the Johnson's which is a cottage that's kind that's a little bit down the way from where the hunt vets and the Christensen's are. So it is also known at this time that everything he wore was either ripped or tattered. Everything was not taken care of and that he owed back rent by three weeks. And after a very severe and long winter, now the husbands, John and then Ivan, and also a man named Matthew, they went out to sea that way they would be able to catch and sell in Portsmouth 
Now, if you don't know where Portsmouth is, Portsmouth is in New Hampshire. And also, they wanted to buy bait by arriving in Boston early. Now, this is on March 5th, 1873. So this is the day before the murder, or the day before they were found. So when they were out at sea, they met a neighbor, and they asked him to stop by Smutty Nose and to tell the women that the wind had changed in their favor and that sailing directly to the mainland would be easier. And so they wouldn't be stopping to leave one of the men on the island, which was normally their custom, and that they'd be home later that evening. It was late afternoon when the women received that message, and they had already prepared supper and decided to keep it hot until all the men came home. Um, now, Karen was now permanently living on smutty nose. She left her position to take a job as a seamstress in Boston, and she was just visiting before she was leaving. Now, when the Clarabella, which is the boat that all these men worked on, docked in Portsmouth that evening, Louis Wagner was present to help tie the vessel to the wharf, and he asked them if they would be returning to Smutty Nose that evening. A question they thought was curious, but hardly reason to be suspicious. And then John explained that they would return home if the bait arrived on schedule, but if it was late, they would stay in port and then they would draw their lines and return home in the morning. He then asked Wagner to help bait the lines ashore, which would take the entirety of the night, and Wagner agreed and left the wharf. Now it was about 7.30 in that evening, and Lewis was the last seen in Portsmouth. He apparently learned that the bait didn't arrive on time, and knowing that John's profitable, biz profitable business, uh, he decided to actually burglarize the haunt that's home. All right, so this was actually the first calm night of the new year since the horrendous winter that they had. And on the shore of the Piscataqua River in Portsmouth, Wagner stole a dory not one hour after the owner had replaced all the pins, the, wear, the worn thole pins on the boat and rode past the murky brick buildings and with all the smoke streaming silently from their chimneys, knowing that people were asleep, so it would be easier for him to escape. And he rode out into the harbor and out to sea. Now this was a 12-mile row between the Piscataqua and the Isle of Shoals, and it was obviously possible, but for it would be impossible for a skilled oarsman to do and in fact John Hauntveth so Marin's husband he had made a three hour trip alone in a boat like this now going from Portsmouth to Smutty Nose so this is where another kind of like discrepancy comes in line because how would he make it from Portsmouth to Smutty Nose in time to actually commit the murders but I digress. Around 10 p.m., the three women in the Hauntveth house decided to not wait up any longer. They changed into their nightgowns, and Marin fixed a bed for Karen in the kitchen, which it was warmer than the upstairs bedrooms. She and Aneth then retired to the adjoining bedroom. There was still snow outside, and with the snow at night, it kind of like creates an illumination of shadows. And what was seen is that a shadowy figure could be seen within the snow that was impacted on the ground. And this is what begins kind of like an eyewitness account of them seeing Lewis approaching Smutty Nose in the actual dory. And actually like on the island, not in like the cove where the Clarabella, the bigger boat it normally is, he rode to the far side of the island and got on the rocky shore. He watched the cottage for several hours after the light coming through the windows disappeared, so he definitely wanted to make sure that the women were asleep when he went in to burglarize it. <clears throat> now, 
Now that he was confident the women were asleep, he trudged up the slope in his heavy rubber boots to the door of the house. He tried the door and found it wasn't bolted, so he just swung it open easily. And in the darkness of the kitchen, he closed the door and jammed a piece of wood in the latch of the bedroom door, behind which Marin and Aneth slept unsuspecting. He intended to accomplish his raid undetected, but a simple moment, a just a noise barked loudly, and Karen woke. She saw the dark figure in the kitchen against the window, and she said, John, is that you? And Marin sat up in bed to her sister and asked if something was wrong. Karen just simply replied, John's scaring me. She's still half asleep at this moment. And with that, right after that, that's when Wagner took the chair in the kitchen and struck her out of nowhere. She screamed frantically as he continued to wail on her with the chair. Now Marin, she reacted as quick as she could. She jumped up and said, Karen, Karen, what's wrong? She jumped out of bed and tugged at the door, but to no avail, she couldn't get, she couldn't get through. Karen struggled to her feet as Wagner dealt her another crushing blow. Bleeding and just completely battered, she was thrown against the bedroom door, freeing the latch, and fell at Marin's feet. Wagner ended up rushed again, swinging and hitting both of them, and Marin somehow managed to drag her sister out of reach. She closed and barricaded the door as Lewis tried to force his way in. Completely petrified, Aneth watched the gruesome scene from the corner of the room. Marin yelled at her to run and hide. And Marin bolted the door from the inside. Com nearly incoherent, Aneth clambered out of a window and stood barefoot in the snow. She was frozen with fright, and Marin kept r yelling at her to run. But it was too late. Wagner <laughs> had given up trying to enter the room, and he left the house. So she, unfortunately, met her demise outside. He approached her. His true identity was revealed in the moonlight, and she said, Lewis, Lewis. Marin was astonished to see, through the window, the man they had willingly accepted and now fiendishly occupied. As Aness stretched her hands before her, he reached to the woodpile and seized a long handle of an axe. In one swift motion, he raised it and drove it straight into Annette's head. Her lifeless body shuddered violently and slumped as Wagner continued striking her. All in full all in full view of Marin, who stood close to the other side of the window, and she could have reached out and touched his arm. Seeing Aneth could no longer be helped, Marin turned her attention to saving herself and her sister Karen. But she rushed to where Karen was, kneeling with her head on the mattress, trying to revive her and get her awake telling her we must run. She begged and begged, but her sister just said she was too tired. Meanwhile, Wagner completed his deadly assault on Aneth, returned to the bedroom door with the axe. Marin's keen self of, self of self preservation told her they were doomed if they stayed, so she wrapped herself in a heavy skirt, hearing Wagner entering the house and she climbed through a window into the snow now silent and she ran and ran the spiny ice covering all of the growth of the of the grass underneath in the rock then she tore her feet she expected to find Wagner's boat in the cove and was near panic upon discovering it wasn't there her first impulse was to hide in the cellar of a vacant building but she knew better Wagner would be thinking likewise, so she ran along the shore to the far side of the island. She passed the cottage. It's widely possible her ears captured the agony of Karen, shivering and clutching a ringe close to her chest as she, as she crawled between two rocks near the water's edge. At the house, Karen was trying to escape through a window. When Wagner burst into the room, he swung the axe wildly at the feeble figure first on Mark, missed, and broke the windowsill. 
Karen's form melted into the room where Wagner twisted a handkerchief around her throat and pulled tightly. He strangled her to death. Wagner must have felt severe agony when noticing that Marin had escaped the room. He left a trail of bloody footprints in the snow surrounding every building around the island. He searched as long as he could, but he had to abandon his hopes of finding Marin if he were to escape under cover of darkness. He went back, dragged Aneth's body by the feet into the kitchen. Exhausted, he brewed a pot of tea, leaving bloodstains on the handle and ate some food he had brought with him using a plate, knife, and fork from the haunt vet's kitchen. And after ransacking the house, he found only $15 and departed leaving Annette's body on the floor beside a clock that had been knocked down off the mantel in the struggle, which stopped seven minutes past one. It was almost eight the next morning before Marin decided to leave from the rocks that she was hiding, and unable to gain the attention of different men working on the neighboring island. She staggered across the breakwater, connecting Smutty Nose to Malaga, so the small channel between islands, waved her arms at the children of the George Inger Bredson, who were playing outside their home on Appledore. Once alerted, George rode a quarter mile to her rescue. He returned her to the care of his wife and gathered men to search Smutty Nose. When the party landed on the island, they discovered what had happened. Not long after... Marin was picked up on Malaga, on, well, technically on Appledore. The Clarabella was spotted in the horizon, and this meant that John and Ivan and their friend Matthew were coming back. Uh, when the man, when the men landed, well, docked, they knew some trouble had happened on Smutty Nose. Ivan asked immediately, "Aneth, where is Aneth?" And Marin was the first that they saw. She's She just answered, Aneth is at home. Ivan and Matthew flew and rode furiously to Smutty Nose. They landed the same time John did, and they raced to the house. Ivan opened the door and saw there lying on the floor his adored lover, Covering his face, he pushed his way out of the door and collapsed in the snow. John and Matthew viewed the contents of the destroyed home. Then they sailed the Clarabella to Appledore. Later that afternoon, John and others carried Marin's tale of terror to the authorities in Portsmouth. Now, back then, it was kind of hard to get word around, but surprisingly enough, this crime the word spread like wildfire. It wasn't long before the description of Wagner was out for the police. It was telegraphed throughout the coastal U.S. and different like outlets for media coverage at the time. So newspapers or different stories around town, people knew that it was Wagner. And most men in the area knew who he was. So, two men both knew of Wagner and formed police. They saw him in Newcastle around 6 in that morning. The stolen dory that he took was also found in Newcastle near a place called Dev Devil's Den. After returning to the Johnsons where he changed some of his clothes, Wagner had caught a 9 a.m. train. There he purchased some new boots and suit of clothes and then dallied with some women he knew at the boarding house. Certainly, John Hontveth told the authorities of Wagner. And that evening, the Boston police found him. Arrested. Wagner actually didn't resist. He just kind of went, followed suit. That next day, he was transferred from, ja from a jail to the Boston Depot for a trip to Portsmouth. Which was also... <laughs> obviously would assume it tickled its fancy that a crowd of like 500 people were around him during his entire trip because they were obviously sneering at him and just belittling him and 
not really understanding why a man like that would savagely kill two innocent women. So it was reported that a crowd of 10,000 people filled the streets of Portsmouth awaiting his arrival. Now, if you've ever been in the Seacoast area, now Portsmouth's downtown is very small. And fitting 10,000 people in that town, like in the downtown area, would, would blow your mind. Now, obviously, Smutty Nose is not... If you think about it, where the Isle of Shoals is, it's actually not in New Hampshire. It's part of Maine. And this is the tricky part when it came to that case because they didn't know where to try him. So that's why they brought him to Portsmouth first. And after actually thinking about it, the jurisdiction would be the state of Maine. And Wagner would have to be tried there. So three days after he was brought to Portsmouth, he left there he left there, left the Portsmouth jail, went to a train, and a lynch mob of over 200 fishermen from the islands and the coast were waiting for him to arrive in Maine. That's how hated this man was. The police escort drew their revolvers just to make sure that they could get him into Maine to the jail that he had to go to. And they also had the Navy company around them, too with their bayonets just to make sure that there was extra security, if you will, to get him into Maine. Uh, Now, the trial, the actual trial itself, started on June 9th, 1873. And after nine days of testimony, 55 minutes of deliberation, he was found guilty and charged. Now, he broke out of jail and was recaptured in New Hampshire. On June 25th, 1875, now this was 27 months, so two years and three months after the actual crime, Wagner was led into the yard of the state prison in Thomaston, Maine, and he was hanged. Now, Marin and John the Huntveth never lived on the Isle of Shoals again. They moved to Portsmouth, where John continued to work as a fisherman. Ivan could could not bear to leave where he and Aneth were so happy. He worked as a carpenter on Appledore for the rest of the summer of 1873 and never out of the sight of the cottage. He always had it in his sight. He never spoke unless somebody spoke to him and he never lifted his eyes from his work when speaking. And at the end of the summer, he returned to Norway and he never returned again. So that, my friends, is the case of Smutty Nose. I know it's a very strange one, but cases in New England, especially older cases, a lot of them aren't covered. And I feel it's necessary for people to actually hear about older true crime cases. Now, if you're wondering, the piece of art that I have created alongside with this voiceover is inspired by Smutty Nose itself, hence why there is an anchor. I have the axe down at the bottom. There's a compass, and I felt that the duality of life and death should have been represented, hence why the skull and the face is there. And there is flowers of New England mixed with a little variety of flowers. So I hope you enjoyed today's tale. If you did, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for more true crime and also some art. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye, you guys.